back on a boat from the a meeting in the botanical gardens and i'm very glad to have made it here because this is really an important subject this is the world leaders dialogue on health naturally managing healthy parks for healthy people in a shorthand we've been talking about this years as healthy parks healthy people Actually, I think that's kind of a no-brainer, but we clearly have to get the message out to more people. I want to thank again the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation for sponsoring these World Leader Dialogues. And I want to thank you, the audience, for giving up your Sunday afternoon. But I'm, I'm glad I did, because I know this is very important and it will be very interesting. So now I am very pleased to introduce your moderator, Nick Sekran, who is the director of Sustainable Development at the United Nations Development Program, a very important title. Nick, I don't see you, but I'm sure you're going to come up. And then Nick will introduce the others. There you are. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Perhaps if my panelists can come and take their seats. I'll introduce them in a minute. So I know it's a wonderful day out there. Um, Sydney beckons, um, lots of green space. Um, and in fact, it's an ideal location to have this conversation, managing healthy parks for healthy people, because this city has so many wonderful green spaces, um, amazing places for recreation, amazing places for the soul, amazing things that contribute to human health and welfare. The focus of our conversation today is the role that protected areas can play in improving human health. And of course, we're all rather preoccupied these days with what's happening in West Africa with the Ebola outbreak. To be honest, there are lots of connections between ecological disturbance and increased mortality and morbidity from illnesses. And we know that environmental change leads to an increase in vector populations, um, such as those um, causing malaria, the Anopheles mosquito, and, and ultimately, in, in many cases, to an increase in disease incidence. The World Health Organization estimates that some 23 to 25% of the global disease burden could be avoided through better environmental management. And of course, protected areas have a key role to play in this. The fact of the matter is that the um, uh, manner in which environmental change impacts human health is imperfectly understood in, in many cases. It works through complex feedback mechanisms. Um, and I worked in Papua New Guinea for many years where malaria is um, um, endemic and you know, we have serious health issues and morbidity from malaria. And one of the interesting facts is that with deforestation, you see an increase, a spike in malaria. And that's because the Anopheles mosquito that survives in a dark forest habitat is less able to transmit plasmodia than the species that favors um, sunlit habitats, pools um, that frequently form, you know, in, in, in areas that have been logged. And so you see this, this spike, and that's because of this, this change in terms of the vector, um, and which, which, is, which, is, which is very interesting. And of course, we see that um, manifest in so many different illnesses, many different arboviruses transmitted by arthropods like flies and midges and, and mosquitoes. Now this is something which is of great interest to me personally because I happen to catch Leishmaniasis um, in the Amazon. This is um, transmitted through a sand fly and it's a disease which and through again very complex feedback mechanisms is associated with environmental change and deforestation in particular. So we'll talk a little bit about that, that's sort of one side of the coin. And then there's the other side of the coin and that is that the world is becoming increasingly urbanized. Um, we're seeing a mass um, demographic transition taking place, um, you know, populations moving in from the rural hinterland into urban centers. 
And the projections are, as in the next 50 years, we're going to see some 70% of the world population living in cities. Now, with that comes a whole set of other um, challenges. Yes, we're living longer, but we're seeing a whole host of non-communicable diseases, things like type 2 diabetes, um, obesity, and so on and so forth, and stress-related illnesses and, 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 and mental health issues manifest in this. To be honest, we were a species that that evolved as hunter-gatherers, you know, living in bands of seven to 20 people. I think the stress of living in large urban conurbations, you know, millions and millions of people, has untold consequences of, on us that perhaps we're really quite maladapted to, as much as we're gung-ho about it, and we think we like to party and, and like to live in, in, in large social aggregations. So there's some issues there which, which, we, really, um, we, need, which we need to explore. And I think the panelists have got a lot to say on this subject, which is rather exciting, in terms of how green spaces, um, appropriately designed cities, um, where you factor in the need for parks in the urban setting, can actually play a key role in helping us um, to overcome some of, these, some of these illnesses. And this, again, for me, I'm fortunate to have a house in South Africa. I live in a biosphere reserve. I'm very fortunate to have another home in India in a protected area. I, for my um, sins, have had to move to New York, and uh, I'm in the process of moving out of the city, Manhattan, um, upstate um, to a protected area, living on the um, border of Ward Ridge Reserve in Westchester County. It's the largest protected area there. So I'm practicing what they're preaching here. I know that I have a busy job, and I know that at the end of the day and in that weekend, I'm going to be next to a protected area, and I'm going to be dealing with my stress by communing with nature. Now, we have a wonderful um, and very distinguished panel um, joining us today. I'm going to introduce them all very briefly, starting at the end um, with Dr. Fuad Mohoji from the Comoros. He's the Vice President in charge of the Ministry of Health, Solidarity, Social Cohesion, and Gender Promotion. Now, Dr. Mohoji has um, had a very distinguished um, career in government. He's headed many different um, um, ministries and he has played a key role in the environment sector and in, in efforts to curb deforestation. And so he has a unique um, oversight and, and an ability to talk to the issues of health and the environment in, in his country. Next we have Dr. Frank Hugelmeyer. This is President and CEO of the Outdoor Industry Association. Frank's on this end over here. Um, he, the world's leading active lifestyle trade group. And in this capacity, he works with the who's who of global outdoor brands and business executives in the areas of recreation, economics, public lands policy, consumer um, trends, and so on and so forth. So very interesting things to say. I met him at lunchtime today. Looking forward to his inputs. Dr. Bill Jackson. Um, Chief Executive, Parks Victoria. Um, I don't think many of you need much introduction to him because he was Deputy um, Director General of, the, of IUCN for many years. Now, in his current capacity, he's managed, responsible for managing national parks, sanctuaries, urban areas, urban parks, um, amounting to some 4.2 million hectares, as well as marine national parks, and so on, which cover... And you know, some 70% of Victoria's coastline, it seems, that you, you seem to have a very large mandate and to have quite a difficult job. Dr. Jonathan Katz is the director of the Global Health Institute. Um, he's professor and director um, uh, of the Institute at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. He <laughs> co chaired, amongst many other things, the health expert panel of the first US national assessment on climate change and served as a convening lead author for the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment and have served for over 15 years on the IPCC. Welcome. Mr. Jill Gil Penalosa is the Executive Director of 880 Cities. He'll tell us what that's all about. It's a really interesting title. I think it speaks to the issues around how we deal with urbanization and, and, we, and, and we manage um, our po urban populations to ensure that they're healthy. He advises decision makers and communities on how to design cities and regardless of, um, and, and then look after communities regardless of their social, economic, and ethnic background. Then we have Christopher Golden. 
Christopher is from the Wildlife Conservation Society. He's the director of the Health and Ecosystems Analysis of Linkages Program, or the HEAL program. He's an ecologist and epidemiologist interested in the interface of ecosystem service provisioning and human health, looking at the global trends associated with biodiversity loss, ecosystem transformation, and health. And he's worked in Madagascar for many years, got some very interesting things to say about his work um, in Macau, uh, mostly, but also in Mashuala and other areas where WCS works. So, quick, after that quick introduction, I think let's get down to business. We had hoped to be joined by the Minister for um, Gender and Development from Liberia, Julia Duncan Castle. Unfortunately, owing to the Ebola outbreak and for other reasons, unable to get a visa to travel to Australia, she's unable to be with us. But she has um, recorded a video, and I'd like us to play it. Now, it's a very bad recording, but I think um, we owe it to her, and I think it speaks to some of the issues that we're dealing with today, to hear her out, so we need to listen very carefully. Please go ahead. Members of the panel and moderators, organizers of this event, distinguished delegates and representatives, distinguished environmentalists, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed unfortunate that I am unable to be present at this event today. The dialogue was short. Naturally, healthy parts were helping people. However, since the issue of protection of the environment is one of which I will give to my heart, I am happy to add my voice to this dialogue. As an indication of my U.S. commitment to ending solidarity with the global movement for environmental protection, I would like to express my gratitude to the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, IUCN, for the invitation extended to me to participate in this important event. Over the years, IUCN has indeed developed a relationship with Liberia, and this is manifested through the various technical supports received from them in the areas of the environment and as well as gender and climate change. I had an amazing time participating in the World Congress held in Jeju, Korea, where I was offered to have met Jeju's vision of real mermaids. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a common adage in my country which says, a healthy environment needs healthy people. Liberia is known to be among the countries with the large forest reserves in the West African region. Ecosystem management and natural resources management is gradually gaining grounds in Liberia. As we continue to remain commitment to the various environmental treaties and instruments our country has ratified and is a signatory to, we are aware that climate change and other man indoors hard ups threaten the protected areas and environment of our country. The 14 years of civil conflict, which brought about harsh economic hardship, led to our forest reserves and protected areas being destroyed. As people go to the forest for means of livelihood and income generating activities, which were not monitored, things have changed. We are cognizant of our protected areas and natural resources being as critical to our sustainable development. Our cultural identity and thus should be managed in a sustainable way. We also believe that women should and must play a key role in this endeavor, as they are also part of, the, of those living within these areas. We rely on these areas of various needs, part of which include medicinal and daily subsistence needs. Ladies and gentlemen, our country, Liberia, is yet again threatened by an epidemic so deadly. It has destroyed many families, has turned thousands of children into orphans, killed many of our already limited health workers, changed our basic way of living, destroyed our economy, and brought upon the Liberian people's sympathization and a blow to our dignity as human beings 
and affirmation. The Ebola epidemic in West Africa is a global threat to health and is a humanitarian crisis, which requires the collective efforts of all countries in the world. Ebola has no boundaries. The response has been mixed. Many nations have been supported and have joined the three countries in combating this deadly epidemic. While others have placed restrictions and shut the borders to us, we recognize that nations have to protect their citizens, but also we call on the world not to ostracize people of Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea. It is heartbroken to see the stigma brought upon by the Ebola virus. But we in Liberia remain resilient as ever before and believe that collectively we can overcome this deadly epidemic. In closing, I want to reinforce this message. Liberia remains committed to the protection of the environment and stands in solidarity with the global efforts in this direction. Remember, we are Liberians and not virus. Thank you all. Sorry, it's not a very good recording, but we stand in solidarity with the people from Liberia and Sierra Leone and Guinea as they fight the scourge of Ebola. Now, I'd like to turn to the panelists and um, have a question first for Jonathan, Bill, and Frank. Um, we're going to sort of divvy up the questions amongst the panelists. Um, so the first question is, is this. The importance of nature to human health and well-being is being increasingly understood. From a medical standpoint, what is the evidence of this linkage? And from a park's perspective, what can nature offer to improve human health and well-being? And if you can pepper your answer with statistics, that would be wonderful. Please go ahead. So Nick, uh, I'll just start by, by saying that the, the Ebola epidemic, which is front and center in public health attention and global health right now, uh, it's an incredible crisis. and it. it we're always trying to move upstream and figure out the determinants of disease. We don't want to be reactionary. And one of the first determinants, of course, is a, a healthcare system, which is lacking in many countries in Africa. That's been the primary focus, but if you go even further upstream, the genesis of the Ebola epidemic, the Ebola virus is a zoonotic disease, meaning that it is cycled through wildlife through animals. Uh, it's, ex it's suspected that a fruit bat is a reservoir, but that's not yet uh, nailed down. They have not grown live virus, so it's unknown. But, but we know that the genesis of these emerging diseases in Africa often come from human intrusion into natural systems, and especially with the bushmeat hunting that is so prevalent in parts of Africa. Uh, it's suspected that this is the spillover of virus from animal into humans uh, is, is what has uh, caused this. And now there, there have been some mutations and whatever it is where the virus is able to um, take hold and infect more people and have more person-person -person transfer. But it all starts with the ecological disturbance and the human-animal interface. Now, as far as evidence, you asked for evidence. Um, there are many diseases with, with known links to ecological disturbance. And in the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment Report, we reviewed all of them uh, as far as what's known to date. I just want to point to something more local. In fact, on Friday, within the One Health session, uh, the, a presentation for, about Henver virus, which is a virus that, that killed horses and people in Queensland, Australia, uh, this was a, a story where, um, you know, virus happens and you respond, but the question is, why did it happen, when did it, you know, and when and where, and what are the determinants? And in presentation on Friday, um, again, this is a known to be uh, harbored in fruit bats, and why did it happen? Well, it turns out that through scientific research, they found that through agricultural degradation, 
of the winter feeding sites for bats. The bats have no place, you know, they would be disseminated, disseminated around Queensland, but now with that, that habitat destroyed from agriculture, the bats are changing their behavior and they're clustering around fruit trees. They're also uh, stressed and, and more higher density, so more transmission of virus. So we've changed the landscape, changed the bat behavior, and then this disease emerges. It's an ecologically mediated um, disease. And uh, Nick, you mentioned malaria, and I'll just say that uh, from our own work and uh, work from around the world, uh, many groups, um, we have determined, especially in the Amazon region and in Africa, that if you cut the rainforest, you change the landscape, you change habitat for mosquitoes, and there are many different species of mosquitoes, that, that one is more dangerous than another. So in the case of the Amazon, by cutting the rainforest, the dominant dangerous species, named Anopheles darlingi, <laughs> thrives. Yeah, the ironic, darling. ironic that it's called darlingi. <laughs> that's, that's the killer in, in the Amazon. So, so the determination has been, uh, we, we're not sure the, the mechanism, but open, open forest canopy, you increase the risk of malaria. Uh, there's been evidence with climate change that uh, because insects, uh, mosquitoes, are cold-blooded, they're more sensitive to subtle changes in temperature and humidity, that we've been seeing more malaria in, in highlands of Sri Lanka and Colombia linked to temperature increases. Uh, and then finally, um, uh, I'll just talk about another uh, link that we know between ecology and disease. And Nick, unfortunately, you, you're moving into Westchester County, which is a hotbed for tick-borne Lyme disease. And studies have shown that if you increase the biodiversity, uh, you reduce the risk of Lyme disease because if you have an intact forest with many different species that ticks can feed on, it's only the white-footed mouse that harbors the bacteria. And so they can live anywhere in a fragmented forest and chopped up into pieces. You have mice, deer, and not a lot of other species to feed on. But, and this is where an intact forest is protective of Lyme disease. So I'll just in summary say there's growing evidence uh, that intact ecosystems protect us from disease resurgence and emergence. And as a medical doctor and a public health scientist, it's my professional opinion that conservation biologists can actually save more lives and prevent more illness than the health sector. Thank you. That work is that work is really interesting. I hope we'll have a chance to unpack some of it a little later. Bill. Thanks, Nick. Uh, Julia used that delightful term no-brainer when she introduced you. And, and I think it is a no-brainer. We've known for uh, many, many years about the linkage between ecosystems and human health. At, at least from a developing country perspective, we've understood that very well. We understand and we've talked in uh, these types of forums for many years and the World Health Organization has talked in these forums for many years about the importance of having natural systems for fresh water, for sources of protein, for protection against uh, natural hazards, particularly floods and landslides. Uh, the disease uh, vectors that we've just heard, whether they're insect-borne vectors or and the zoonotic disease transfers, we've known about that. We've known very well for a long time about uh, human-wildlife conflict uh, when we're at borders of transition uh, between agriculture and forest clearance. We've known all that. I'm, I'm not sure if we've focused very well on how we uh, deal with that very well, but ever since uh, we discovered that we caves and we could live in those. We've tried very hard to isolate ourselves from nature. Uh, we've now reached the epitome of this. We're inside one of them. Uh, and this is our natural system now, but we weren't uh, genetically designed to live in air-conditioned spaces in isolation from green space, uh, isolation from blue space. And I think that's what we're catching up on, the research of uh, isolating ourselves moving away from nature, uh, it's starting to show its toll as we become increasingly urbanised. And as you said, Nick, uh, I think currently we're sitting at about 54% of the, 
of uh, global population is now urbanised and that transition has happened in an incredibly rapid time. I think I said dinner function yesterday that in the lifespan of most of our careers, it's gone from 25% to 54. In, in the working life of our children, it's going to go to 70. And what we see is an increasing level of lifestyle-related disease, cardiovascular disease, uh, type 2 diabetes, a whole range of other things, including some cancers. Uh, we're also seeing uh, a lot more mental illness, uh, stress, anxiety-related disorders, uh, depression, uh, and many of those can be tagged back to uh, living in such an unnatural environment. Uh, recently, um, Deakin University undertook a, a refresh of a study that they've done several times before, looking at that body of evidence, and they reviewed over 650 papers published since 2008. Very clear evidence about that connection uh, between uh, open space parks, protected areas, and uh, human health with really compelling evidence about uh, the challenges of urbanisation in particular uh, and the opportunities both from, from improving mental health, physical health, uh, spiritual health and social well-being by reconnecting us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I was going to share uh, some thoughts and Bill shared a lot of what I was going to touch on and I think that Coming from the recreation business community, and obviously there is a huge economic impact to this shift that Bill is talking about, and I know Gil has spent a lifetime working on this shift to an urbanized uh, humanity, really, and a dominant lifestyle globally. The issues around those, the cancer and the diabetes and the heart disease and the stroke, the joint uh, injury and disease, depression. Uh, this is personal for me. My father was a very active lifestyle person. My mother was not. She has uh, four of those issues right now going on, and he does not. And they're in their late 70s. And so as you're watching the aging population, I can see it within my own family right now that my father has a very low cost of health, we're seeing very little expense related to that within the family, and we're seeing a very high related to inactivity. What we do know, and why I brought that up, is when you see a proximity of health infrastructure and park infrastructure in and around where people live close to home within 10 minutes, you see a big increase in terms of the physical activity. 32% of uh, teens in Los Angeles, according to the, the Trust for Public Lands, were less likely to be overweight and 26% more likely to be active if they were within 10 minutes of a park or a facility. Uh, you see the same thing if there's a new trail built, you'll see as much as a 55% increase in terms of physical activity by that community because of that park and trail in that, that area. So we're seeing a growing body of research coming in there uh, that's really supporting creating greenways and park infrastructure in around urban environments. And the last thing that I'd say is we as the active lifestyle industry, one of the things that we saw is all of this body of what happens when you're inactive or what happens when you're obese. And we reversed that. We started to do a research project that said, all right, what is what makes a difference to someone who is active? What are the benefits? How do they get there? What does that look like? And what we found is eight out of 10 people who participated regularly in outdoor activities and recreation and had access to that, nine out of 10 actually felt less stress in their lives. Eight out of 10 had stronger family relationships. Eight out of 10 felt more proactive about managing their health. And eight out of 10 felt younger. Um, and eight out of 10 wanted to try new activities. So this is a huge opportunity, a huge finding that it really explains the popularity of the lifestyle once people get into it. Okay, thank you. I'm going to change the topic a little bit and turn to, um, to the Vice President from the Comoros. He has um, worked hard to set up a marine protected area, the Moheli Marine Park and is looking now to expand the protected area system and expand marine protected areas. 
And of course, he's been working on environment and now he's working on health. And I wonder what you have to say, sir, about the health protected area linkages in your country. Merci. Je voudrais d'abord dire aux distingués délégués, à l'honorable assistance, salam alaikum. Je commencerai mon, mon intervention en allant dans le sens de la première intervention qui a été faite ici pour montrer l'importance justement de la nature par rapport à, à la santé. Je n'ai pas de commentaires euh, à faire, mais je mettrai l'accent spécifiquement euh, au niveau des communs où en 2001, nous avons eu à initier un parc marin qui couvre une zone assez importante. Initialement, l'idée n'a pas été bien appréhendée par les communautés environnantes. Pourquoi Parce que déjà, elles voyaient des systèmes d'interdiction d'aller faire les pêches traditionnelles, d'aller mettre les filets. Mais avec le temps, ils ont compris qu'il y avait du bonheur puisque tout d'un coup, les prises ont augmenté. Nous sommes passés de 250 tonnes à presque 500 tonnes en moins de 10 ans. Et nous avons dû constater qu'il y a eu d'autres espèces euh, marines qui n'étaient pas dans la région mais qui sont venues. Mais la partie la plus importante, ce n'est pas seulement cette augmentation de la protéine puisque, pour votre information, nous avons la moyenne de 25 kilos euh, de poissons euh, par, par habitant, mais dans la région du parc marin, les dernières statistiques nous laissent croire qu'on dépasserait le 30%, le 30 kilos, pardon. Aspect très important. Deuxième aspect très important, la conservation de la zone marine va de pair avec la conservation des zones terrestres, ce qui a permis ces cinq dernières années de l'augmentation de la pluviométrie. Et là, ça va dans ce sens, puisque euh, parmi les, les constats que j'ai eu à faire de ce transfert du ministère de l'Environnement à la Santé, nous avons fait des études en, en décembre 2013 sur les maladies non transmissibles. Nous avons dû constater qu'au niveau de l'île, il y a 10% de la population qui était diabétique mais qui ne connaissait pas son statut. Mais bizarrement, au niveau de la région du parc, c'est tout à fait l'inverse. <rire> Puisqu'avec la pluviométrie, on a dû constater que la culture maraîchère s'est intensifiée, on consomme beaucoup plus de légumes, ce qui a fait que la population en général de cette... Je ne dis pas qu'il n'y a pas de diabétique, mais ce taux de diabète a sensiblement diminué, de même que le taux de, 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 de tension qui semble prendre beaucoup plus euh, euh, de l'ampleur au niveau de l'île, puisque c'est une petite île où avec euh, l'augmentation du nombre de véhicules, chacun voudrait se déplacer en véhicule, on marche peu, mais dans cette région, à cause de changement de mode de vie, notamment la consommation assez fréquente des de, de, de légumes, nous avons dû constater que ce problème de diabète, ce problème de tension était moindre. Bien sûr, il reste un travail de communication, de sensibilisation, et cela, ça va de pair avec la déclaration de Libreville de 2008 sur la santé et l'environnement. Et Nous sommes en train de travailler surtout au niveau de, de la sensibilisation des communautés, sensibilisation de, de la population pour la prise en charge eux-mêmes de leur propre en, environnement. Euh, je ne voudrais pas être très long, mais c'est juste pour dire que la conservation euh, de la nature, nous avons commencé avec le parc marin, nous comptons dès le début de l'année prochaine, continuer avec d'autres aires protégées qui vont aussi nous permettre de rentabiliser, de rationaliser les différentes plantes dont notre forêt fait richesse. Et là aussi, au niveau de la santé, ça va nous aider à pouvoir beaucoup plus contribuer sur les traitements, je dirais, organiques, mais non, non chimiques. Donc, tout acte qui va dans le sens de la conservation de la nature et d'office de nature, 
au-delà de l'écosystème, bien sûr, de nature à contribuer au développement de, de la santé. Je vous remercie. Wow, that's really interesting. Uh, the impacts of things in terms of fish um, um, offtake, I think, are known from protected areas around the world. And I think that's clearly, it's great to see. Um, uh, et, et je voudrais souligner, c'est traditionnel. On utilise ni les filets, ni les bateaux motorisés. C'est un pirogue seulement. Right, it's amazing. But the issue in terms of diabetes and in terms of um, diet, I think, very interesting. Let me turn to you, um, Christopher, um, and maybe on the same subject. I mean, can you tell us what types of environmental change are leading to impacts on food security and nutrition from a health perspective? Now, the last session dealt with food security more broadly. If you can look at it from the health dimensions, that would be wonderful. Sure, thank you. Uh, from our perspective at WCS, we really see this as an incredibly important <laughs> issue. Malnutrition is the single leading largest risk factor for early death around the world. And we see around 2 billion people affected by micronutrient deficiencies, which are really debilitating from a development standpoint and a human health and well-being standpoint. Yeah. And if you compare public health with medicine, really the main difference is that one deals with prevention, the other with treatment. And so if you look at those kind of thematic differences, conservation and public health have quite a lot in common. They're both about the prevention of kind of negative outcomes or the loss of something in our future. And so I think reframing a lot of this dialogue to see the co-benefits of simultaneous parallel goals of conservation and human health is really important. And so from this specifically looking at a food security and malnutrition dimension, you could see things like wildlife population collapses both on land and in the sea as major drivers of food insecurity and malnutrition. Work that we've done in Madagascar specifically has shown that local people's over-exploitation of wildlife as a food resource could lead to up to 30% increases in the rates of anemia. And this isn't something that is a developed world disease where anemia just might make you a little bit tired. We showed that there was approximately a 0.7 gram per deciliter decrease in hemoglobin when wildlife was lost in the area. And what that would mean is a one gram per deciliter decrease could lead to 25% increased risk of maternal mortality, perinatal mortality, so early death. And so what would be avoided through these kind of robust maintenance of wildlife populations could really be delivering health benefits while also maintaining biodiversity within the forest. I think this is an even more compelling case in marine scenarios, as the vice president mentioned. And so we really could be promoting marine conservation areas as a sustainable delivery system for human nutrition and food security, where we are blocking certain areas for specific types of use, but not all of those fish would be captured. There's no fence, there's no gates that keep them in there. So all of the adjacent communities would really be benefiting from that. And so in terms of the trends, the global fishery collapse, global wildlife population collapses, there was a recent report that showed these kind of 50 to 60% declines in wildlife populations around the world. Similarly, everyone has heard of kind of bee colony collapse disorders, the loss of wild pollinators. All of this is intimately linked to food security around the world. And the conservation of forest areas, the maintenance of hedgerows, the maintenance of reforestation projects could really facilitate wild pollinators and local pollinators in delivering improved agricultural and food security. Additionally, from a climate change perspective, some work that has been done within the HEAL Consortium, which I direct, uh, has looked at the role of climate change in actually exacerbating the future scenarios of food insecurity. There was a recent publication in the journal Nature, led by Sam Myers, that showed that increasing CO2, which is the dimension of climate change that no one will argue with, led to 30% decreases in the zinc content of all of our major food staple crops similar results for iron. And so if we think about our world eating even the same amount of food, and we heard in the last Global Leaders Dialogue that even that is a huge stretch, all of the populations around the world will become further and further malnourished given these scenarios of climate change and its effects on our crops and food security. And so we would need to eat more and more in order to obtain adequate amounts of these micronutrients, which would just lead to more and more carbs and starch that would further metabolic diseases, further all of these NCDs that we're incredibly concerned with. And so I think on a variety of different fronts of environmental change, my main fear 
is that all of the major leaps and bounds that the public health community has made over the last 50 to 60 years will be completely derailed by the erosion mm -hmm. of intact ecosystems. Absolutely. And so what I would really promote this audience, as we all know, is that we really need to develop these co-benefits, these parallel goals between our common mission as public health and conservation scientists. Thank you. I'm going to change track yet again. Let's now look at the um, question of cities. And we've talked a little bit about um, the fact that the demographic face of our planet is changing as we become more urbanized. And there are undoubtedly many advantages that cities bring to society. There are increasing evidence that urban lifestyles are leading to lifestyle-related diseases and an increase in mental illness. There are arguments that urban parks and protected areas provide one means to improve human health and well-being. Gil, can you talk us through the evidence for this and describe what park agencies and the health sector have been doing in this space? And also, while you're at it, explain to us what 880 means. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I think that it's a reality that the population is growing. Also, it's a reality that around the world we have been very successful at decreasing the population growth. So the rate of growth is substantially decreasing, and all the forecasts say that the population is going to stabilize around 2050 or 2060. So, we're, but nevertheless, since the population is much bigger at the, at the younger ages, it's going to continue to grow for these 30 or 40 years. So, less than 200 years ago, we had a billion people. Today, we have around 7 billion, and we're going to go to around 9 and, nine and a half billion. So, not only do we have to improve the cities that we have today, but we have to create great cities for these 2.5 billion people that are going to live in cities. Also, it's very clear that we are moving to our cities. Less than 100 years ago, only two out, of five, two out of 10 people live in cities. Today, five out of 10 live in cities, and by 20, in 100 years from now, it's gonna be eight out of 10. And it's a fact, so that, that, that it's hard to reverse. And why are people moving to cities? Because despite all of the problems in cities, they, there are more opportunities. People are not dumb. People move to cities because they spiral the misery in cities is less misery than what they had before. In the last 30 years, over 300 million people in China moved to cities. I was working in China last week, which is a great example of a country where they have learned how to survive, but they really need to do a lot of work learning how to live because the issue is not cities and not cities, but how do we create those cities? They are totally obsessed with the cars. So it's about cars, 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 and it's traffic jams and gigantic buildings and very little green space. So this is, there has to be a total link. People say, should we have neighborhood parks or should we have big natural conservancy areas? We should have both because they, they satisfy different needs, which is also why it's so important to have, when, when the, we say healthy parks, healthy people, it's not because it's a nice slogan, it's because it's a reality. We need the small neighborhood park. Every child must have, every person must have a park within walking distance, every person. Uh, but that, because in that neighborhood park, that's where we build community. That's where we meet the parents of our children's friends. That's where we develop a sense of belonging. But we're not going to be able to play football there, so we need the medium-sized parks. And then we're not going to be able to go canoeing, so we need the metropolitan parks, like wonderful Centennial Park here. But then we also, in order to really absorb nature at its fullest, we need the natural parks, which is one of the nice things of entities like Parks Victoria that deals with the city and the state and, nat and, and national parks. So I think we need to have those linkages, and it has to be a seamless connection between all parks because sometimes in many cities we have in many countries we have the bureaucracy that it says oh no this is municipal no this is state no for the citizen the citizen doesn't care which is municipal and state or federal it is a whole system to recreate so the big challenge but more than challenge is a wonderful opportunity is how are we going to build those cities for better or for worse we have this magnificent opportunity in the next 30 years and whatever we do or don't do as cities is where people are going to live for hundreds of years. So either we create magnificent places to live, 
for billions of people over the next three, four, five hundred years, or we create horrible places that are going to have horrible implications for everybody. And finally, the comment of ADAD cities is that we feel that when we look at any city, to in order to evaluate the city, we should see how the city treats its, its most vulnerable people. The most vulnerable people are the children, the older adults, and the poor. So ADAD is, whenever you look at any, if people can walk through the park, if there's an intersection, if it's safe or not, just think, is it safe enough for an eight-year-old? Is it safe enough for an 80-year-old? Then it's going to be safe for everybody. We need to stop building cities as if everybody was 30-year-old and athletic. <laughs> Every year, we are having over 5 million, and this is public health, and this is parks. Every year, we're having over 5 million people injured while they are walking on the sidewalks, they're injured by cars. Over 270,000 people are being killed by cars when they are walking on the sidewalks. So all of this is linked. But it's not because the city's fault. It's because of poorly designed, poorly implemented, and poorly managed cities, which is something that is different. It's not just because of cities, but it's because of how we are building those cities. And what does 880 mean? 880 is the concept that everything that we do in the cities should be great for an eight and great for an 80 year old and then it's going to be good for everybody from zero to 100. I think that's just such a wonderful concept. <laughs> now, I've worked um, with Trevor in the audience, Lesejo, many other friends from South Africa um, on trying to protect urban green space in the city of Cape Town, city of Johannesburg. And you know, when you first approach city planners, um, it seems like rather a luxury. You know, you're dealing with issues of how do you accommodate people and dealing with reparation in past of South Africa, a lot of people disenfranchised and they don't have housing. And so then to argue that you need to create or protect green spaces, sometimes a bit of a tough sell. And this health argument, I think, is one that we haven't used adequately. Yeah, we talk about recreation, but recreation sounds like something like a very much nice to have, something that rich people enjoy, and something that the poor um, are preoccupied with fulfilling their basic needs, perhaps value less. I don't agree with that, but that's certainly a perception out there. And I think in this regard, we really need to look at the cost-benefit calculus that comes from um, you know, urban green space and recreation. So with that, perhaps I could ask the panelists who be occupied with cities, I mean, what can you, what can you say in terms of the cost-benefit calculus? What economic evidence do we have to sort of, to, when we're talking to recalcitrant um, um, urban planners and sort of trying to convince them to say, that, you know, look, this, this green space is critical and it's going to have a dividend in terms of, in terms of health benefits um, what, what, what can we put on the table in terms of facts? I think yes. that, it, uh, just to round out the point that I was making to your question, I think it's a magnificent question, but it's not about the planners. The planners don't decide anything. It's about politicians. This is not a technical issue. This is not a financial issue. It's a political issue. That's why everybody has to get involved. And we need to create the, 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 the arguments because the reality is that it's not a financial, we're seeing in all the cities, they are building fantastic highways and flyovers. I go to work in India, in India where only 15% of the population have cars, but nevertheless they're building elevated highways. It's almost unethical, but you know that no city has so much mobility through the private car. So should they be spending all of that money? But someone is making a better case for the highways than we are making for the parks. We see in North America that even though the cities are safer now than any time in the last 40 years, year after year we increase the budget of the police. Maybe the police is also making a better case than parks because the parks budgets are being cut year after year. So I think that we need to make the case around public health. We need to make the case around environment. We need to make the case around economic development. When I was coming, now I work with this NGO based in Canada and I have had the privilege to work in over 180 cities. But before I was commissioner of parks in Bogota, in Colombia, in five years, we built over a thousand parks, neighborhood parks, and over five metropolitan parks. And the argument came, why should we invest in parks when there are so many needs of the poor people? I said, if you really care about the poor, when the poor people really feel miserable, 
is in the leisure time. When they are working and cleaning the floors of our bank, they have as much anxiety as the president of the bank. Maybe the president of the bank even has more anxiety. But whenever there's leisure time, the president of the bank has restaurants and theaters and clubs and travel. The minimum wage work at cleaning the floors doesn't. So when we improved the use of the leisure time, when we use it, what we're, we're doing is really improving the quality of life. And parts are such a wonderful equalizer. So I, I do think that that is a key element. We need to make a much better case because across the world, we keep seeing how the parts budget are seen as a luxury that is easy to cut. Uh, and, 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 and we need to stop that trend. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I, I, we are in the quality of life business when you think about the urban park development uh, business. And obviously the recreation industry is in the quality of life business, inspiring people to do great experiences and to go out and, and be physically active. And what we found during the global recession, when the economy was, was tanking in 2008, and we were looking at our numbers and performance as an industry, we grew for the, for the first six months of the recession when in, I think it was October of 2008, everything collapsed, the credit systems, everything. The outdoor industry during that time grew at 10%. We were selling a lot of gear. We then had about a six month period where the credit situation was just too onerous to overcome for anyone and for any business. But then once that six months period was over, we grew for 5% to 10% in the United States for the next four years. And for most of that time, the world was in recession. So here's one economic sector out of all that are out there that was growing and compared to everything else. And what was happening? Well, it's very much what Gil was talking about. People, when they were most stressed, when they had to choose what was most important to do with their money at that time, when they couldn't trust their retirement accounts, when they couldn't trust uh, their political environment, they couldn't trust what was going to happen in the world financial system. What they could trust is that they could go to the local park with a family. They could go and buy inexpensive outdoor gear and go have a meaningful experience. So the infrastructure in and around communities is so critical but it's often looked at as what you do with over, over, leftover land, leftover water, and leftover time. And you have to realize when people are not at work, they're in the leisure activity. And you're seeing this globally, particularly in developing in new and emerging markets. If you look at Europe and in, in the US, the explosion of the leisure class and the explosion of the infrastructure of parks around the world came on the heels of an industrial revolution. And we're seeing those industrial revolutions all around the world, particularly in China, spent a lot of time in that area as you're watching them grow out of a production economy into a leisure class very quickly. It's not taking 30 or 40 years like you've seen in Europe. You're seeing it instantly happen in these emerging markets. And what needs to happen, what we're not seeing, is the, is the development, the city development, that's creating livable cities. Because that is what people are going to do when they're not creating a, a production or a creative class. And uh, it was so compelling to see that recovery and the performance, the economic performance. I found it very interesting in the video about the economic impact in terms of obviously what's happened with tourism and whatnot within East Africa, you see the exact same thing uh, globally in outdoor recreation. Recreation in just the United States, 646 billion in consumer spending every year, 6.1 million jobs, 80 billion in federal and state taxes. It's an enormous economic sector, but it's often dismissed as a nice to have. Mm -hmm. well, Frank, if I could just take on your you know, add to your economic dimension and, and talk about some uh, new health statistics. Um, green spaces in cities, uh, probably the most detailed analysis to date, looking at uh, prospective, uh, a cohort study over time, showed that green spaces in cities, and including tree cover, 
uh, has tremendous impact on depression, anxiety, and stress. Uh, equal, equivalent to uh, not having health insurance and not having much income. So these are, these are new analyses showing a very important uh, health benefit from green spaces in cities for mental health. The other thing about uh, urban parks is that there are multiple benefits. Uh, if you think about the urban heat island effect for climate change, you know, with heat waves over a, a concrete buildings and black asphalt, uh, the urban heat island is very dangerous. Uh, there have been studies that show that green space, uh, planning green space in cities can reduce the risk of heat mortality up to 100%. Uh, and I know this because this is my colleague who uh, was a postdoc of mine who did the study. It was his PhD thesis. But anyway, so green space can can affect uh, can be great. For, uh, you know, shown there's evidence on mental health benefit, on urban heat island reduction, and also with climate change, it's not just about temperature. It's about extremes in precipitation, the hydrologic cycle. So urban runoff. Of, uh, over impervious surfaces, so green space has multiple uh, benefits from you know water management to mental health benefits uh, and the urban heat island and and more. And yeah, and that that economic argument is not just a city argument. Uh, in rural counties and rural communities around the United States, particularly in the West, you see a significant increase in tourism in rural counties, creating sustainable economies that are normally reliant on a boom and bust energy development economy. And what we found actually in one headwaters economics in Bozeman, Montana, has done some very interesting research on this in the West. And what they found is rural Western counties with more than 30% of their land under federal protection, increase jobs at a rate four times faster than rural counties that had no federally protected lands. So it's not just an urban economic argument, it's also a rural development uh, balanced economic strategy. But I'm very encouraged actually, because by your <clears throat> little story there, because I thought we were breeding a new generation which was happier in cyberspace than in real space. Uh, well, it's great to see um, you know, that when things turned down, there was a downturn that people still turn to nature for a solution. I'd like to ask the Vice President from Comoros um, a question though. In your case, when you're designing the city of Moheli, are you taking green space needs into account? Oui, nous, nous les avons pris en compte, mais il y a un problème puisque il y a le problème de l'espace qui se pose, puisque euh, avec moins de 290 km², nous avons bientôt une population de euh, 50 000 habitants. Et c'est aussi le grenier des autres îles, puisque c'est l'île où il y a le plus de productivité agricole. Ici se pose un problème, certes, d'espace, mais il faudrait aussi trouver d'autres moyens de ne pas pousser tout le temps les, les habitants, les paysans à aller vers la forêt pour continuer la déforestation. Donc, au-delà de la volonté politique, il y a un problème de moyens financiers qui se pose et une politique, justement, de gestion de cette population pour que elle ne reste pas seulement attachée à l'agriculture traditionnelle. Là, le problème, l'équation espace-population se pose. Nous avons des réflexions qui vont dans ce sens, mais ce problème quand même ne se pose pas comme dans les autres pays, puisque si vous m'avez bien compris ici, il y a d'abord la lutte de la vie. Il faut d'abord avoir à manger, avoir à vivre pour penser au loisir. Donc, il nous faut d'abord dépasser ce stade. It's a very good point. I'm now going to change the topic a little bit and ask Bill a question. He's doing something rather exciting, which I hope is going to take off, and we're going to see it, see it um, um, replicated. 
Parks Victoria has entered into a very positive partnership with Medibank, one of Australia's leading insurance companies, to deliver the Action in Parks program. What are some of the most positive outcomes from this partnership? And perhaps you can tell us what it does in the first place. And how would you use it to promote similar partnerships globally? Yeah, <clears throat> thank, you, thank you, Nick. Perhaps if I just set some context first, um, Australia in some ways is probably already looks like what a, a lot of the rest of the world is going to look like in another 40 or 50 years, in that 70 odd percent of our population already lives in cities. It's one of the most urbanised countries on earth in spite of our wonderfully large open spaces. Uh, we all like to live along the coastline and like to live in cities for some reason. Uh, as we heard, and you said this before, Nick, there's many advantages of living in cities and lots of disadvantages, uh, particularly related to sedentary lifestyles, disconnection uh, from the real world uh, and stress that's related to living in such a high speed environment. And we see preventable diseases uh, increasing. Uh, we've talked about those here already, type two diabetes, uh, um, and cardiovascular disease, for example. We also see an increase in mental health uh, challenges that we've got. Type 2 diabetes alone, uh, the incident of that has increased 30% in 10 years in Australia. Uh, I would think that's probably getting fairly close towards epi epidemic uh, proportions. The You're trying to catch up with us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's also a trend you see in developing countries. It's, uh, I, I would be interesting to graph uh, the rate of urbanisation versus the rate of uh, type 2 diabetes. I imagine they're pr pretty similar graphs. So the aim of the Active in Parks program is really to get more people more often more active in, in the parks that we have. Uh, to try to improve their physical, uh, mental and social well-being. It's a fairly simple aim. And we do that through a set of targeted programs uh, with the partners that lead on this. Um, perhaps the one that's of most interest is a, a green referrals or a green script program. And, and I know that uh, several other countries have also take, have uh, a similar programs. And this is where a general practitioner prescribes to go out and do activities in a park as part of uh, um, the uh, restorative health programs. Uh, the nuance that we've put on this uh, through Active in Parks is that they're linked up with local health providers, uh, local non-government organisations and local government agencies in some case, cases to ensure that those programs have uh, support of trained instructors uh, that not only guide them in the use of, of those parks, but also make sure uh, that they keep using them as, as often as they, as they can. And the incentives there, and uh, Nick, I know at lunchtime you asked me this question, whether the, the insurance company offers any decrease in premiums, we haven't found that as necessary, I don't think, at the moment, because there's incentives almost all around. The, the insurance company's got an incentive by reduced claims anyway, uh, but also better social license in the community. Uh, the patient, of course, in, uh, improves health or, or gets better much quickly uh, than, than otherwise. Um, from a park point of view, uh, we're achieving our goal of getting people uh, more active in, in our parks. Um, we also have several other programs like welcome, welcoming new migrants. They find it quite challenging, uh, refugees, uh, people in particular to use parks. Uh, they don't like the uniforms and uh, they don't like to use government space and often their experience of using open space is quite traumatic. Uh, it's often places where the conflict is, is most severe. Uh, and we have other programs targeted particularly at youth uh, that either have mental health challenges or are disconnecting uh, from education. Uh, I think the key thing, though, is the most interesting, and therefore how you can transfer it. It's a partnership uh, led by a foundation, the People in Parks Foundation, whose pure mandate is to work on healthy parks, healthy people. You have a very progressive insurance company, uh, Medibank, that <coughs> is, uh, wants to find different and new ways to do things. Uh, you have a park service that is also uh, Parks mm -hmm. Victoria that comes to the party. Uh, and of course, the health sector itself is pretty well focused on all of this. 
um, convergence of interest, basically. If you want to find out more, yesterday there was uh, the People in Parks Foundation uh, launched a website called Active in Parks and there's lots of information that can be used by anybody. Well, thank you. I still think you know, my insurance company gives me a discount if I join a gym. So I still feel that there's space here to explore. Um, and perhaps if it's the issue of free riding, you know, um, and there are ways to actually prove that you've actually visited a park and for how long and so on and so forth. And um, so hopefully maybe down the line, this is something we might see in terms of new progressive insurance products. And then I'll ask one last question, to, and this time to Chris, and then I'm going to ask all of you to um, cook up questions for the panel. So please um, be away in terms of thinking um, um, what you'd like to ask. But first, um, and the last question from my side, Chris, talking about evidence. What evidence is there from your work in Madagascar and elsewhere that investment in nature-based preventative health will yield, yield improved outcomes to people, parks, and the planet? Easy question. <laughs> not the easiest of question. I'm not sure I have examples from <laughs> Madagascar, but from the larger HEAL portfolio, I can give you some examples of what w WCS is doing in other landscapes. Please go uh, ahead. So some of the work that we're doing in equatorial Asia and in Indonesia, Singapore, et cetera, is looking at the relevant impact and values of maintaining forest within Indonesia because of the fire-based land regimes there and all of the emissions that go out into the atmosphere, the particulates that go into the atmosphere and have downstream health effects on infant mortality, respiratory disease, cognitive deficits, et cetera, to see if there might be some sort of sustainable financing mechanism whereby all of the health costs that are accrued from all of this forest burning could sustain conservation programming because of the tremendous benefits, not only to the biodiversity, but also to human health. And so we're in the midst of a project really looking at characterizing that within Equatorial Asia. Also a project that's being led by Stacy Jupiter from WCS Fiji and Aaron Jenkins, who is based at Edith Cowan University, is looking at the role of preserving upstream forests, so upstream forest conservation in this almost ridge to reef model in Fiji, and looking at the role that maintaining forest quality upstream has in reducing river sedimentation, which facilitates bacterial carriage. So it's linking the incidence of typhoid and other bacterial illnesses to the quality of the forest upstream. And they're showing some very promising results that conservation might be a win-win in terms of protecting the habitat and also protecting downstream health. So I think those are really two potential nature-based mechanisms for treatment uh, that really simultaneously benefit forest conservation and human health. Go ahead. Yeah, if I could just mention one related to climate change adaptation um, this is a project I, that I read in an IUCN report, and Julia, correct me if I'm wrong, but adapting to sea level rise, there's a comparison of building seawalls versus, you know, building, uh, restoring mangrove swamps that would buffer against storm surge and would protect the fisheries. And, and I think the cost is one-seventh the cost of building seawall, am I right? Yes, so, the, so by preserving mangroves or restoring, uh, restoring mangroves, one-seventh the cost and multiple benefits in preserving fisheries. So that's a great example of using nature for protection and saving money and, and, and having add-on benefits. That's great. Okay, so let's turn to the audience. Um, I'm sure you've all got lots of questions for the panel. Um, so please go ahead. Come on, you can't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> In the front. Hi, um, my name is Diane. Um, I would like to ask a question uh, maybe uh, to Dr. Golden. Um, uh, do you think that uh, uh, vertical farming could be a solution in the future uh, for having controlled environments for uh, better maybe crop yields and uh, also um, as a solution to keeping land for, for uh, other uses or wildlife. Do you think there's a future for that technology? 
I don't know if I'm the person that's best positioned to answer this, but I'll give it a I'll give it a try. I do think that there is a tremendous need to try to understand the benefits of vertical farming and a variety of other different solutions. I think that we have very quickly realized that our ability to provide food in any sustainable way for our growing population is incredibly limited, even if we were able to deal with a lot of the uh, loss to food waste, to uh, discards, and to distributional issues, it's very, very difficult for us to produce enough food for our planet. And so very innovative solutions that have to do with precision agriculture, vertical farming, uh, benefits that intact forests can provide to improving dietary diversity, diet quality, and um, nutrient supply are incredibly important. So I don't know if I can give you a great answer in terms of the vertical farming, but I do think we need to get very innovative, very creative, and also look inward as to what our dietary needs truly are. Great. Any further questions in the front? Thanks, uh, Karim. Um, I would like to uh, maybe to change the debate because uh, those square remarks from uh, Dr. Chris Gordon about the, the impact of climate change and the, the financing of the conservation um, through the impact of climate change and the impacts on the, uh, the population. Uh, I mean, those communities that are working hard on the ground uh, they don't have much financing for that, for what they are doing. And on the other side, we have countries that are impacting on the climate change, on the climate. So um, there is little funding for that. We have some funds for adaptation, for resilience. They don't have access to the funds to cl clean development mechanism, for example, or for carbon markets. It's very hard for them to get to this market. So how do we do the link between those two aspects, biodiversity and climate change, and get more financing for those countries. I think it goes beyond the technical and scientific debate. It has to be on the debate on the, uh, the fora of uh, climate change and biodiversity and create a link between the two of them. I don't know who is gonna... Well, I think we need to sort of bring it back to the topic of health, because otherwise this is a very large subject in its own right and warrant a leader's dialogue <laughs> to, to answer. But I think one key thing we've heard today is whether it's nature deficit disorder, um, the sort of issues that we've seen in terms of urban spaces and stress-related illnesses and so on, or it's the impacts on malaria or leishmaniasis or other viruses and so on, the health dimensions of environmental change, is that we need to make the case from a health perspective for investment from the health sector and investment from the donor community. The Global Fund is a big investor in, 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 in anti-malaria programs and so on to actually invest in protection um, as, as a really cost-effective means of reducing morbidity and mortality and therefore health costs. And so therefore mobilize resources <laughs> from a sector which hasn't traditionally invested in our, in our business, in conservation. I think that's our challenge. And to, and, to, and to overcome it, we need hard facts and statistics and we need a way of communicating to, to the donor community and to health um, um, in investors and, and to ministries of finance as to why an investment in protected areas is a good health investment, not a biodiversity investment, a health investment. And that's something I think we need to do more of. So perhaps that's a good question to put to you. Um, how would you go about doing that? And, and, and have, you, have you tried yet? Hmm. Yeah, we, maybe I, we have tried. I'm not sure how successful at the moment. But put, put it into context, I think uh, we have a common problem with the, the health sector. Uh, and if you, there's, but there's a magnitude of difference between the money that governments and others spend on health versus they spend on conservation. So it's trying to find where that overlap is, where is that commonality and trying to work together. And I know from the work that we've done with the health sector, the majority of their funds goes into critical health care. Uh, and that's increasing as the level of disease increases or level of illnesses uh, in many places we're living longer uh, and creating greater burdens on the healthcare system for a whole range of reasons. The 
the people that work in preventative health often are very few compared to those that work in other parts of health and their budgets are relatively small. I think that's the commonality because what we can do is help with preventative and restorative health uh, and that's uh, so we can find that common goal and perhaps grow that budget uh, and grow conservation share of that budget. I think we do have a crucial role to play. It's an argument we're not particularly good at putting, perhaps we haven't uh, recognised it a lot, and we, but we can only put that argument if we go together with uh, the health sector. Uh, and I think Gil was right, you have to win the hearts and minds, but you also used to have to use all the other tools available to us. Uh, the medical profession in particular uh, likes to see clinical evidence, I think is the term that they use. Uh, they don't uh, trust anyone else's evidence and the economists who generally hold uh, the budgetary strings like to see economic evidence. I think we've got pieces of that all over the place and uh, we can put that together much better. We recently reviewed a lot of the economic literature from where we come from and just a simple one was uh, the amount of nitrogen that comes down through the two rivers that we look after for the government going into the uh, port. Uh, I think it's from memory over $400 million per year worth of nitrogen fixation just from the parks that are managed there. The alternative would need to be uh, filtration plants that would remove that nitrogen. If you allow that nitrogen into the port, uh, it's going to affect the fishery uh, and therefore the amount of protein that comes out and so on. So I think we can make those links. I think we, it's essential we do, and I believe it's urgent. Uh, and that might segue across a little bit to climate change, because uh, I think we've all seen that what climate change does exacerbates many existing problems. And so that perhaps there is a convergence of all three. So I, you know, regarding bridging with the health sector and the money that goes into tertiary care rather than the more preventative, I think we're at an opportune time because uh, there is much wider recognition of prevention. And I'll just tell you that the day before the UN Earth Summit, we held a conference, a health, health climate change conference, and the, the highest ranking government official of the United States, the Surgeon General of the US, spoke at our session, and he said, and I quote, the United States does not have a health care system. And he repeated that, and he said, we have a sick care system all the money goes into hospitals and treating, and he said, we need to invest in healthy neighborhoods, healthy, you know, broader communities, green space, and in, in this case, it goes out further to uh, natural, natural, uh, you know, preserved wetlands. And, but anyway, I think they're getting it. And so I think we're at a great time to have this discussion and style on yeah but i would agree with bill that the body of 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 economic evidence in terms of the preventative side has not been adequately pulled together and it's still in its infancy certainly in the u.s right now which uh has prevented us from being able to do the political change and change that argument and it's truly necessary it's a body of work that is becoming more and more increasingly important so I'm looking at Julia and Trevor here and other IUCN colleagues and saying maybe this is something we should put on the table as a recommendation from this Parks Congress. We need to address this. When you have a look at what's going on in West Africa at the moment in the three countries affected by Ebola, the costs of it are enormous in terms of the impacts on GDP growth. We're pumping billions of dollars into this. Okay, the Obama administration asked for several billion dollars the other day um, from Congress. And it's well over what the entire global environment facility has received by way of its replenishment. And the problem isn't going to go away because you don't deal with the root cause and from the bushmeat trade, it's just going to reemerge at some, at some stage down the line, maybe in another country. So with that, we have three questions, four questions. Oh my gosh, it's getting really exciting. So in the front. <laughs> uh, just following up from the point that Jonathan made, um, I, I think that we, we are aware in terms of local parks that it matters how close we are. And I think we need to move from a proximal position in terms of the medical profession as well. While I think it's correct that we need economic evidence, I think we'll find that 
what's happening in hospitals, certainly in Melbourne, is that they're beginning to put gardens into those hospitals. And the medical practitioners in those hospitals will begin to see the benefits of those gardens for their patients, staff and visitors. From there, we get a ripple outwards effect where they begin to recognise the benefits of nature for human health and well-being. And in some ways, I think it's the personal experience, the proximal experience of nature that is going to change hearts and minds as much as it is the evidence. Good point. Now we've got three, three hands up. I'm going to take those three questions and then we're going to close. I'll sum up quickly. It is Sunday night and now everyone wants to go out and have a have a drink or get out into nature and <laughs> wander around the park. Um, Thank you. My name is And I'm Jessica. sorry, there's one over here, so we'll take that as well. Please go ahead. Thank you. My name is Jessica. Uh, some of the strategies to solve some of the, the, the problems of urbanization and population growth uh, includes, of course, urban farming and intensive farming and uh, issues of aquaculture now that, uh, for example, in East Africa, we are emphasizing the issue of aquaculture. But we're having a challenge because the number of uh, people who are investing in aquaculture uh, prefer to put fish cages in the lakes or in the rivers and then feed them. And that, now that results into a problem of nutrients, adding more nutrients into this water. How do we solve this problem? The second issue is that I have not had you address the, the, the challenges from uh, the private sector, for example, industrialization and, and uh, uh, effluent discharge into the protected areas. In Uganda, we have an issue where sometimes at night, people, uh, owners of big hotels and others, discharge waste uh, directly into the lake or into the water system. And the issue of enforcement is a big problem. And therefore, we need to address the issue of reaching out to the private sector, addressing the issues directly with them, and uh, support uh, law enforcement. I thank you. Okay, I'm going to take all the remaining questions now and then yeah. answer them in one shot. So I think, Sue, did you have a question? Let's yeah, see. Susan Lieberman. Uh, first, we, we had a session yesterday on wildlife trafficking from parks. And I do want to note with appreciation the comments of the minister from Liberia and re greatly regret that the visa situation prevented her from being with us. My question is if any of the panelists could comment on the linkages between illegal or unsustainable wildlife trade from parks in the developing world and risks to public health in those countries. Thank you. Great question. Uh, we also got a question from uh, Matt Roberts on Twitter, and he would like to ask the panel, uh, what does the panel think comes first for health, economic empowerment or nature engagement? <laughs> mm. Okay, we have a last question over here. Sure. And I think at this stage we are going to have to stop. I know, I know, well, maybe if you don't all mind staying a little longer, we could take another question. My name is uh, Leonardo Songo. I work for IUCN based in Cameroon. My question is to the Vice, Pres Vice President of Common, Monsieur le Vice President. I would just to pose a question par rapport à, à l'aménagement uh, du territoire, parce que nous savons que la plupart des pays en Afrique, le tiers monde en général, sont souvent confrontés par ce problème de l'utilisation de l'espace, surtout les espaces verts. Comment assurer que nous avons dans les grandes villes des espaces verts qui sont aménagés pour non seulement répondre aux enjeux de l'environnement ou la santé de la population, mais surtout, surtout pour assurer quand même une politique verte. Parce qu'au jour d'aujourd'hui, nous parlons de la politique verte euh, en termes de développement. Est-ce que ça a été, c'est vraiment intégré, ça fait partie de votre politique dans votre pays? Je vous remercie. Okay, and the lady in the back over there must be the last question. <laughs> and as I walk over here, I'll say another Twitter question. Uh, is bushmeat trade the real cause of Ebola? Good point. <laughs> um, Mr. Vice President, can you answer the question 
just put to you while we're waiting. Bien sûr, bien sûr. Je pense que la question qui nous a été posée ici est une question assez euh, pertinente, surtout dans nos pays. Quand je dis dans nos pays, je ne parle pas seulement de, de Comores, mais aussi des pays du continent. Du fait que il y a un combat à mener, il y a un travail à faire au niveau de nous, décideurs politiques d'abord que nous puissions comprendre que la santé n'est pas un secteur de consommation, mais c'est le socle de développement. Et il ne peut se développer qu'avec la synergie, la complémentarité des autres ministères. Et d'ailleurs, je saisirai cette occasion pour féliciter notre organisation commune, l'OMS, qui a fait des études assez intéressantes dans ce domaine, euh, intitulé « Les déterminants sociaux de la santé ». Si nous, décideurs politiques, arrivions à comprendre que la création des zones de loisirs, la création des parcs, euh, le contrôle de l'urbanisation dans le sens d'aider d'abord l'intérêt humain, cela va nous permettre à résoudre tous ces problèmes. Euh, pour répondre à votre question, je dirais qu'il y a d'abord un travail de sensibilisation, il y a un travail pédagogique qui doit se faire au niveau de nous, les décideurs d'abord politiques, pour pouvoir mettre en place euh, cette politique au niveau des de pays. Thank you. Take the question, please. Thanks, Nick. Um, Helen Meshnabeski from the Friends of Irimu. We look after a grassland which is a protected area in, in the urban area in Melbourne. I think there is a body of evidence out there. I've been to lots of talks that aren't just about conservation and there is evidence of nature and the benefits. What I think, or the challenge I'd like to give to this panel is that we need to look outside our, our current spheres and match it up. And some of it is already costed. And whether it's the Outdoor Industry Association can finance that sort of stuff, whether the Global Health Institute can find the academics to get together. But I also liked Gil's point about the politics because it, for preventative health to work in, in parks, it needs to come from local-based community members. And it needs to be something that they understand and get together and get involved in so that more evidence can be collected. Like in Australia, there's a longitudinal study of growing up in Australia that's been extended by the health funding and parks should tap into that and look at that and get a question on that study for asking about activity in parks. Thanks. Okay, so now we've got a lot of questions to answer. Let's start off with a boller. And Jonathan, if you could take those two questions, sure. is it really caused by the bushmeat trade? And then Sue's question, I think. Okay. Um, well, I'll say I'll say one thing. That by the way, I'm on sabbatical this year and uh, working <laughs> with the World Health Organization, so uh, I'm on secondment. So, um, so I'll answer that question, even though I'm not officially with the World Health Organization. Um, you know, as far as uh, um, bushmeat and Ebola, we, we do know from uh, lots of studies that this is a pattern and it matches a zoonotic disease, the way it, it appears throughout uh, Western Africa sporadically. It behaves like a zoonotic disease. It's like Marburg virus as well. So there's pretty good certainty that it is a, one of these wildlife uh, you know, it, it's a reservoir in wildlife. Presumably, you know, there's some circumstantial evidence that some some species of fruit bats, but it's not definitive yet because the virus has never been grown out. The question about bushmeat is a it's 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 a little bit complicated because number one, it's probably somehow you know whatever in, increases the probability of humans contacting whatever the animal reservoir of Ebola is uh, and, and that could be you know, human intrusion into the forest 
And you know, the story of HIV AIDS uh, is a story of bushmeat hunting as well, for, uh, coming from chimpanzees. And it's possible, people think probable, that bushmeat hunting and the you know, blood, blood contamination spillover of virus from the animal to humans, it's probably um, a risk factor. But I would say that really the bigger risk factor is that there is no public health infrastructure in many of these these, uh, they've been, you know, neglected, and there's no money, and, and that's the bigger problem, because bushmeat hunting has been going on for a long, long time. I think that's it. one of the risk factors, but the fact that there's been no investment in public health in those regions is the bigger issue, really. Nick, can I add something to that? I think that this question is really interesting, and it has come to me in Madagascar as well when we had the bubonic plague outbreak last year, which is largely driven from zoonotic disease transfer as well. And I think many times the initial reaction when any of these outbreaks or emergencies occur is to pinpoint a particular animal reservoir and figure out ways to exterminate that. Mm. And that is not the answer. That's not the silver bullet. There are millions, if not billions, of viruses and zoonotic pathogens out there, thousands of, to hundreds of thousands of different hosts, and they will continue to evolve and emerge. What we really need to think of instead of targeting specific animals or targeting specific environments is really, and Steve Osofsky, the head of the Wildlife Health Program at WCS, wrote a really nice article on that, is to manage a very few number of human behaviors that put us at risk. And Jonathan put it quite nicely in terms of probabilities. And if we can limit primate and bat harvesting and consumption from an ecological standpoint, they can withstand almost no extrinsic mortality and we know that there's a very disproportionate likelihood that they contain viruses and other types of pathogens that very easily transmit to humans. The live transfer or wet trade of wildlife generally, any type of luxury trade or urbanized trade, there's really no ethical need that this should be allowed. Very other cases where there's a subsistence need for certain types of hunting, but all of the wet and urban luxury trade or international transfer of any type of wildlife really is not necessary. And finally, when there's kind of mining organizations, logging companies, oil and gas industry that go into these pristine areas to exploit them, very often their employees are not fed properly, they're not subsidized properly. And so they then need to rely on all of these wild areas for food and nutrition, which then presents this other interface for increasing risk. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's also about holding different corporations responsible in addition to managing our own behaviors. We make a point about the reaction being, let's go and exterminate all these animals, and we're just going to protect us. We started off by reflecting that these sort of these complex feedback loops that, that are at play here. And let's take a case of another situation, another continent, Leishmaniasis. And that's basically transmitted by sandfly, the cutaneous and, sub, and, 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 and respiratory um, forms of the illnesses in, in Latin America. It was perceived that if you cut down the forest, if you cut down the habitat of the sandfly, you would reduce the incidence of the disease. And precisely the opposite happened. There's been some work in Costa Rica looking at counties that have been heavily deforested versus those which have still got their um, forest cover largely intact. And you see a much higher incidence of Leishmaniasis in those counties which have been heavily deforested. And the feedback loop seems to be linked to El Nino and climate change and the environmental variability factors that no one had a clue about. So going out and killing all the whatever, fruit bats and so on, have all sorts of other really negative and scary impacts I wouldn't like to think about. Um, Gil, you've had a comment, and then I think we'd like to take the questions from Mel on, uh, about Melbourne and, and, and Victoria. Yeah, my comment was in, in regards to the evidence base. I think we have all the evidence that we need to make decisions. I think we need to develop a sense of urgency. We are, the population is growing at the pace of three Australias every year. So we were, 10 years ago, we had 600 million cars in the world. Today we have got a billion. From the, and we know the impact that cars have on climate change. How much longer do we need to wait to decide that we cannot continue to grow, uh, could to create cities based on the use of private cars? So we need to make decisions on this. 
from the point of view of parks and making the case of parks and economic development, we live in a never more globalized world. And in a globalized world, the best people, however you define best, it can be the best pizza makers, the best musicians, the best carpenters, the best medical doctors, they can live anywhere they want to. So every morning, the, the politicians must wake up thinking, how can we retain our best people? How can we attract the best people? And one of these ways is about quality of life. So when we say healthy parks, healthy people, that healthy people is not just from the medical point of view, but healthy people is a healthy environment, is a healthy economy, is a healthy mental health, is a healthy physical health, and making all, the, all of these linkages. And you say that hopefully they, they will give you a discount to go to a gym. The reality is that why people are driving to the gyms to walk on the treadmills <laughs> when they should be walking in the parks. They should be walking on the sidewalks. In the U.S., there are many cities in the U.S. that if you are born in one neighborhood, the life expectancy might be 64 years old. If you are born in another neighborhood, the life expectancy is 90. There's 20, between 20 and 30 year difference of life expectancy according to the neighborhood. And when you go and look at one, they don't have parks, they don't have, their sidewalks are in horrible conditions, they don't even have grocery stores, they have only convenience stores uh, where they sell garbage food, they don't sell. So all of these things is how are we going to build? We, we, my, 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 I want to end by saying that we need to have a call to a sense, developing a sense of urgency and realizing that we cannot wait another 10 years or 20 developing evidence-based when we know there are dozens and hundreds of studies that if we live close to a park, we are going to be more physically active. So every citizen should have a park within walking distance. We don't need more evidence-based to make those decisions. Melbourne, and this is the last comment on Australia, Melbourne, 30 years ago, Melbourne would not have been in the top three hundred cities in the world. Today is one of the top five in any world ranking. But they change. When people say cities don't change, well, along the Java River, there were only factories. Now there is a magnificent linear park where people walk and people bike and people run and people skate and people use canoes. And that turn laneways into wonderful linear parks also. And, they, 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 and no one wanted to leave. Melbourne was, was a donut city empty in the middle and people living outside. Now everybody wants to live downtown because there's public spaces and parks. So cities do change, but we need to do what Melbourne has done in the last 30 years. We need to do it in many cities around the world, but in the next 10. Well, Australian cities have obviously got it right because they're consistently ranked amongst the most lovable cities on the planet. We really do need to move on. And I'd like to turn to the questions on Victoria and Bill, that's for you. And then we have a last question um, from the lady from Uganda dealing with the private sector. And I wonder if you'd like to take that. Thanks, Nick. And I will just take a quick crack at the question about economy first or nature first. Uh, I think it's not either or, it's probably both at the same time. Uh, healthy economies depend on healthy societies. Healthy societies depend on healthy ecosystems. Uh, that's the basis of healthy parks, healthy people. I think it's the fundamental underpinning of sustainable development. And we've, I think we need to come back to that there and not see these things so often as trade-offs, but as uh, mutually independent in terms of, I, I agree totally with the comments about reaching outside and, and bottom up. The, um, the healthy parts, healthy people approach is, has to be contextualised. It's very much a bottom up process uh, to get local people engaged and involved because uh, it's really about their health. So uh, it makes a lot of sense to do that. But reaching out, IUCN gave uh, the mandate for this Congress to reach beyond the park sector, to reach beyond the conservation sector. Uh, and I think at least the improving health and well-being, healthy parks, healthy people stream did that. I think around about half of the participants in that stream for this Congress that recognised that was their top priority stream uh, came from outside the conservation sector. And if you look at this panel here, you only have one park director. Perfect. Yeah, <laughs> private uh, sector. Yeah, the private sector, and there were a couple of questions that, that touched on that. And I, it, whether it was around the cage and the and the and the uh, building a, a business within uh, the river, and I think there was also one about the effluents coming out of from a pollution standpoint. And it, it, this touches a, 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 a nerve of mine. We've done a. I'm fortunate enough to work in an industry 
of CEOs, uh, senior executives, leaders that have an incredibly strong environmental th ethos. And that's shared not only within the companies, but also with the consumer and with the conservation community. That's unique. And we have an enormous society that is not built around full cost accounting, where the cost of being able to put your waste out anywhere in the world, whether it's into uh, uh, an urban environment or whether it's into a, a, a national park and a, nature, a natural environment, it has done significant damage to the world, to the planet. It is time for all countries, really, and all companies to now move to full cost accounting. And I know this is a change in the fundamental economics of the world, but we've been building an economic system that's not built on the full cost of doing business. Uh, one of the things that we were trying to do in the outdoor industry uh, to help rectify this from our standpoint was to measure the environmental footprint of every product we designed. We built out an in index to be able to measure that on apparel, footwear, and equipment. It now is actually uh, successfully called the HIG index. We realized that the impact of this indexing had such a broad scale, it was much farther beyond our industry that we created, and I was part of uh, the original board of directors that helped uh, form this organization, the Sustainable Apparel Coalition, just to build this indexing for other industry sectors. And fortunately now we have uh, companies like Target and Walmart and large uh, Gildan and, and many uh, larger um, brands around the world starting to now adopt this indexing tool. It's going to help reduce the environmental footprint of product, but we have such a long way to go. And until we really have a legislative environment around the world that requires companies to do full cost accounting, we're going to continue to see uh, whether it's a small business to a large business, waste coming into the natural environment that we're in a constant state of cleanup. And that is really the hidden cost. And someone said, can the outdoor industry or the association help fund? But I, we are a profit center as a parks community. We are a profit center. It's not proven because you are often seeing uh, the the we're in the business of cleaning up other people's messes too often. <laughs> and that cost is often overlooked, whether it's in an urban environment or in a rural community. So you, you touched a little bit of a nerve for me. There's so much more that the business community needs to do. And I can say, I really urge the IUCN to make sure that there are more business leaders here in the future at these conferences, because you're only going to make the major change by bringing in the progressive leaders around the world to really embrace the change that we need. Okay, now with that, I'm gonna try and sum up very quickly and bring this amazing panel to a close. Um, you know, it's what a rich discussion. I mean, this really adds to the armory of arguments as to why we need protected areas and why we mustn't stop for even one second in our efforts to expand them, ensure they're better managed, get more funding allocated towards them. We only looked at two dimensions of the health issue here today. We didn't discuss the pharmacopoeia issue, the issue that forests and reefs and everything else um, host potential future cancer cures, um, the whole bioprospecting industry. Um, we didn't discuss that at all. We didn't discuss um, community health dimensions, um, issues around medicinal plants, um, tradition. Uh, we didn't discuss that at all. We did discuss the role protected areas can play in addressing um, perverse um, health impacts associated with environmental change. And I think we know that protected areas are effective at dealing with threats, effective at dealing with deforestation. And we know that deforestation, one manifestation of environmental change, has huge impacts in terms of health. We've talked about malaria, we've talked about leishmaniasis, the number of people around the planet who are affected by these diseases, often the poorest communities in the planet, and not small. In the case of leishmaniasis, some 200 million people are at risk in Asia, Africa, Latin America. 
and some 2 million new cases um, occur every year and some 20 to 50,000 um, um, deaths attributed to the disease. Okay, it's fairly small. But if you sort of add them all up, it's 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 pretty big. And so protected areas are, are critical in helping us to address some of these issues. And then secondly, we have the issue around um, um, cities. You know, you said that the population is going to um, ta table off at 9.5 billion, etc. The our UN statistics are saying it's going to be much higher potentially 11 billion people. So we're going to add another 4 billion people to the population of this planet. And we are becoming more urbanized. If our generation now doesn't do something about green space, it's not going to happen. You're going to have cities that have been developed without taking into account the needs for green space. It'll be very difficult and very expensive to retrofit it after the fact. So we can't wait for the next IUCN World Congress to start doing something about this. We've got to do something about this now. And this should be a very strong message from um, this Congress and this leadership forum um, to the world community about the imperative of doing it. And just a small aside on my side as I move to on the outskirts of a protected area, which happens to have lost all its predators in Westchester <laughs> County in New York. I'm going to be an advocate for the reintroduction of the cougar, uh, mountain <laughs> lion and wolves into the outskirts of New York. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And of applause for the panel. <laughs> very good. Thank you.